The average passenger car weighs somewhere between 1 and 2 tons, and rarely exceeds 80 miles per hour. Despite that, there are many scenarios that can damage the tires of that car badly. Many drivers know the pain of a car tire spontaneously bursting, splitting open in a ditch, or being pierced by a nail. Whenever that happens, it's time to get the spare wheel out. What about the tires that are fitted to the wheels of an airplane, though? Even when empty, a Boeing 747 weighs over 200 tons, and may weigh up to 240 tons by the time it takes off. When it comes in to land at the end of a flight, it hits the ground at approximately 160 miles per hour. Imagine the force of that impact when the tires hit the ground, and yet the tires don't burst. How is that possible? Let's take a closer look at the tricks and techniques used by the designers of aviation tires and wheels to strengthen their products and keep the plane safe. At first glance, the construction of the wheel of a plane isn't all too dissimilar to the construction of the wheel of a car. Look a little closer though and you'll see that there's a lot more going on than meets the eye. The cleverest part of the whole design is probably the suspension struts. They need to be especially resilient so that when the plane makes contact with the ground, any bouncing or rocking is kept to a minimum. Ideally, the passengers should only feel a very slight jolt as they touch down on the runway. Because of the extreme forces that a plane is subjected to in this scenario, standard suspension springs wouldn't be up to the job. Instead of using regular springs, in the landing gear of an airplane, you'll find a set of multi-chamber nitrogen-on-oil long-stroke shock absorbers. They do have a spring inside them, but the function of the spring is to inject pressurized nitrogen into the landing gear. On especially heavy airliners, you'll also find stabilizing dampers to provide extra shock absorption. These reinforced sets of landing gear look a little like a set of ribs made from 4-inch high slabs of concrete. They help the landing gear to remain intact while coming into land at more than 150 miles per hour. If a regular car wheel were to be exposed to such pressure, it would instantly be torn apart. The suspension struts of the landing gear are attached to the wings and fuselage by way of a drag system using two hinges. This system serves a variety of purposes. Firstly, and perhaps most importantly, it provides additional drag as the plane slows down. Secondly, they play a vital role in allowing the pilot to both lift and release the landing gear. The most striking thing about the design is the fact that the wheels and rims are made from a highly durable combination of magnesium, zinc, and titanium alloys. They're made up of two separate halves connected by single thick bolt during assembly. Once assembled, the exterior of the tire is coated in a special glue treatment and then the bolts are fastened. You're probably wondering what the glue is for. After all, the bolt is thick, so why is that not enough? The answer is that the glue guarantees a watertight connection between the two valves. This is absolutely crucial. If water were to get into the wheel while the plane is in flight, it would freeze. Frozen water inside the joints of the landing gear would be dangerous enough, but as the airplane came in to land, the force of friction would cause the frozen water to boil, which presents a second wave of danger to the plane's operations. This is why tires and tubing are kept to a minimum, and it's also why the majority of aircraft wheels are filled with nitrogen rather than oxygen. Nitrogen doesn't burn and nor does it form condensation. It's all about risk management. Another way that plane wheels differ from car wheels is in the cross section, which is more like a motorcycle wheel than a car wheel. The purpose of this is to provide maximum contact between the tread of the wheels and the surface that the plane comes in to land on. Car tires are designed for the road, and that's about it. A plane has no standard terrain, and in an emergency, it might be required to land anywhere. That's why on the outer rim of the wheel, you'll find nothing more than a few simple longitudinal grooves, which are there to reduce the effect of aquaplaning when the aircraft comes in to land on a wet runway. If the grooves weren't there, there would be a high risk of the plane sliding. 
As you can probably imagine, the composition of these tires is somewhat different from the composition of the tires on your car, too. The tires on an airplane are made from a blend of natural and synthetic rubber textile material, and a little steel for additional strength and reinforcement. The ratio is about 50% rubber, 45% nylon and polymer, and 5% iron. The tires feature a multi-layered design with each layer interleaved with durable nylon and aramid cord. Between every single parallel layer is another thin film of rubber. The complexity of design is necessary because the tires are subjected to extreme pressure when the plane lands, and so the layers of the tire touch together, but the rubber film prevents them from grinding against each other and causing damage. So far, we've only discussed the standard landing speed of an aircraft. In some situations, a plane might be required to land at almost 280 miles per hour. That heats the tires up to a sweltering 260 degrees. Under ordinary circumstances, they would melt. The melting point of rubber is only 200 degrees, but the layered structure protects them from harm and ensures that they don't suffer too much damage. They still might get a little scorched coming in to land at that speed, though. Creating landing gear can take up to six months. Why so long? Well, it's because it's a very complex process involving multiple separate stages. Let's look at a real-life example. The Boeing KC-135 Stratotanker was a popular military aerial refueling aircraft during the 1960s, but there are barely any of them left now. The way that the landing gear for this model of aircraft was made, though, changed the whole future of landing gear assembly. That's because of the extensive use of machine technology that went into the job, as opposed to the more hands-on approach of the past. The machine cutter gives the parts their desired shape, but keeps it below a certain temperature during assembly so that it doesn't overheat. It's dropped into a chilled mixture of water and oil, and then a support hole is drilled through the center of it. Look at the size of the metal cutting drill. Any additional material left over after the chassis is built isn't wasted. All the discarded pieces are collected together and then sent to be melted and turned into something else. Here we see the machine hard at work ensuring that the holes and shapes being cut are perfectly shaped and proportioned. A drill this powerful can cut through titanium alloy like paper. By the time this process is over and the machine is finished grinding, it will have processed and produced three separate parts to be fitted together. At the same time, the support framework is cleaned, polished, and blasted with compressed air until the metal reflects light like a mirror. The construction process still isn't over though. It still has to be quality checked for defaults, errors, and weaknesses. Checks are carried out by humans and machines. The machines perform a measurement check on all three dimensions to confirm that everything is where it's supposed to be. And now, finally, the support is ready. This enormous amount of labor has resulted in just one support. To make a full set of landing gear, we would still need struts, exhaust cylinders, and brake lines. It's a difficult business. It might surprise you to hear that the wheels occasionally need replacing. A plane spends most of its life in the air, so surely the wear and tear the wheels are subjected to is kept to a minimum. Actually, that's not true. The average airliner will take off and land at least twice a day. And so over the course of a full year, the tires will have driven more than 3,000 miles across the ground. The tires of a commercial aircraft are designed to survive a maximum of 500 landings. After that, they've reached the end of their useful life, and it's time to replace them. That isn't an easy job either. When it comes to replacing the tires of the plane, you actually have to replace the whole face of the wheel. As a starting point, you need to bring in a trolley that would usually be used in highway construction. What you see here is mechanics applying a jack to the wheel, but the jack looks more like a car. Even at this size, the jack is not enough to lift the wheel on its own. A hydraulic pump has to be brought in to support it. With that in place, the mechanics can finally get to the wheel and set about their difficult job. 
to begin with, the mechanic unscrews the fixing nut and then removes the locks. The wheel is now clear to be removed, and it makes its exit on a special aviation trolley. You might be surprised by how small it seems. Its diameter is only 5 feet. Don't forget what it's made of, though. Inside that small-looking tire is a layer after layer of heavy rubber and steel. You'd never be able to lift it up with your bare hands. Now it's been rolled away, the new wheel can be brought in to replace it. Fixing the nut in place is a delicate and precise task. If it isn't done perfectly, the wheel will hang loose from the wheel mount. That's bound to lead to an accident, and if it were pulled away from the rest of the landing gear during landing, it could burst through metal. For obvious reasons, that can't be allowed to happen, and so the mechanic works with a special wrench that comes with a sensor. The sensor confirms the nut is fitted properly. Even now, there's still more to do. The next job is to pump the tires up to the desired level. Remember, we don't use oxygen for this task. We're using pressurized nitrogen. With that done, the final few fixing bolts are added, and only then can you say that the wheel has been fully and safely replaced. What do you think about the task? Do you think it looks complicated? How long do you think an experienced mechanic would take to replace a plane wheel in this manner? If you say somewhere between an hour and two hours, you're being generous. Most airlines allow their mechanics only 30 minutes to perform this task. Aviation companies don't like it when their planes are idle. There are occasions when a little downtime can't be avoided. If a support component of the landing gear breaks down, the repairs will take somewhere between one and two months. Why so long? Well, firstly, identifying the precise nature of the malfunction isn't easy. The component usually has to be sandblasted in order to see the defect clearly. The sandblasting process will reveal even the tiniest crack. Here we see a crack that's been sandblasted and then magnetized and inspected under ultraviolet light. Only then can we see this thin green strip. It's a crack, but you'd never be able to see it using only your eyes. Even though it's tiny, the crack has to be repaired. The part is immersed for 10 minutes in cadmium and then lowered into a weak chromic acid solution. It's then delicately washed in water while being exposed to a stream of air. Think of this like a jacuzzi for the plane part. All of the chromic acid is swept away by this process. For the next 24 hours, the part will be heated up to 190 degrees, and this burns away all the hydrogen that forms during galvanization. With that done, the part is dipped in liquid nitrogen and cooled to minus 129 degrees. The purpose of the low temperature is to compress the steel thus decreasing the size of the damaged and repaired area. Once that's done, it can be heated again and returned to its original size. It's now time to put it back into place. The sealed clutch is placed inside the piston. The piston is installed inside the shock absorber. The shock absorber goes back into its cylinder and then the shock absorber is checked for leaks. Restoring the paintwork is the final touch and the job is then complete. It's because of detail, extensive and stringent repair and installation processes like this that landing gear can survive extreme impacts and incredible touchdown conditions. How incredible? Well, let's look at another real-world example. In 1988, Odessa Airport in Ukraine was the site of the fastest successful plane landing of all time. The landing was made by a 2134 aircraft, which was moving far too fast because of errors made by the pilot. As the wheels touched the ground, the plane was still moving at 300 miles per hour. In theory, the maximum stress that should be placed on the chassis of this aircraft would have been exceeded at 205 miles per hour. Somehow, the plane stayed in one piece, and the landing was hot and dangerous, but successful. This is a world record for landing speed, but the record was not set deliberately. As you've hopefully seen and understood by now, the landing gear of a plane is robust, secure, and durable. But it's not infallible. Even when landing gear breaks, though, accidents aren't necessarily severe. 
We've seen this happen with a Boeing 737-800 belonging to Turkish Airlines. The plane was on the Istanbul to Odessa route when it made an emergency landing at Odessa Airport. As it touched down, the concrete supports cracked and then splintered. One of the wheels broke off and flew into the pit of the plane, and then the landing gear broke off and hit the ground. It looks spectacular, but it all ended safely, with the passengers evacuated down the emergency ramps. Boeing eventually replaced the broken rack of the landing gear, and the plane was as good as new. The technology that keeps us in the air when we fly on a plane is incredible, but the technology that helps it to come in and land safely might be even more impressive. Plane wheels may look small and insignificant, but they're actually one of humanity's strongest and most impressive inventions. Subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications, and you will be the first to know when a new video comes out. Thank you for watching and see you soon.